So welcome back, everybody. Um, and I hope you enjoyed your breakouts. So we'll start with a report back on the experimental design session by Jimmy. Um, is that? Yeah, do you want to start? Go for it. I'm Jimmy from UCSF. While we get this to work. Ah, OK. Um, so I was uh, in a room with Kristen, Holger, Ori, and Goji chairing the session uh, called Experimental Design and Methods. Um, and so we started by posing a few questions to the general community um, and, and started a discussion along these bullet points. And so the first is, is sort of thinking about sample sourcing. Uh, and the very first point that Bruce brought up is that GTEx is, is just a really great gold standard template for how we should be doing sample um, sourcing correctly. Of course, with the understanding that most of these samples are from deceased individuals, and for the Human Cell Atlas, there are going to be many samples from um, living individuals as well. Uh, but the specific aspects of GTEx that were really great were, were the availability of extensive documentation, uh, as well as uh, standard, standard operating procedures for uh, a number of different processing workflows um, on the tissues. Um, and then there were really two representatives who I think have, have gotten the farthest in terms of uh, building um, a, a workflow that involves multiple teams taking tissue all the way to generating um, high uh, information content genomic data, and that's represented by uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as well as um, there is a, a UK contingent. Um, and, and sort of what we got out of, uh, out, out of that is that both teams um, seem to have implemented this assembly line approach where you have four teams that, that really work together, starting from the operating table, um, then going to the pathology, and then um, lab processing and profiling. And this really um, enabled the experts to, for each of these elements to, to really be able to do their uh, work, but then also pass on the samples to the next stage um, time efficiently. Uh, and another point that sort of resulted from this is, is that it seems like both sites were thinking about saving multiple samples per tissue. There's one sort of piece that's frozen, one OCT, one FFPE, and um, both sites made a point about archiving the sample so that we can go back and uh, profile them again for validation. Um, and then uh, Jay Shin and Ad, Ad had asked a question and, and made a suggestion about sort of these SWAT teams that, that um, we'll read then um, discussed in detail, and, and we thought this was a great sort of idea to have uh, a mobile group of experts to then go to remote sites, and the specific examples given were, you know, working with St. Jude's Hospital. And, and this is a useful exercise both for the, for the SWAT team um, to learn from the hospitals, and since in these hospitals there are, there are many resident sort of tissue experts, um, but then also to train the hospital staff on how to handle the tissue, and, and in some cases, how to prepare the tissue for high-dimensional single-cell profiling. Um, and, and actually, this was the very first point made by Bruce, which is, you know, we really should um, think about sample annotation the same way that we've been thinking about cell annotation. Um, and that means to have, to have a, a, a set of sort of um, rules for how we annotate every single sample in ontology as well as a website or a web tool um, so that it, this, this can be made easy for everybody who's going to be entering that data. Um, and that would really facilitate interactions with the donors and pathologists. Uh, so after sample sourcing, we had a discussion on how to uh, optimize sample preparation and handling. And the key really that, that came out of this is, is that protocols Many of the protocols that we're currently using for dissociation um, are tissue specific uh, in the sense that one protocol that works for, for example, recovering um, pancreatic cells is not going to work for recovering other types of cells, um, maybe because the pancreas is, is sort of this um, you know, highly active tissue. Uh, but within each tissue, protocols could also be cell type specific. So a good example there is that if we, if we crowd preserve tissue slice, uh, if we crowd preserve tissue cores with DMSO, um, then that might be great for then isolating immune cells later on, but not so great for recovering other cell types. 
And finally, it's also assay specific, whether or not you want to do single cell versus single nucleus RNA-seq would require different considerations for how we handle the tissue. Um, and because protocols are tissue cell type and assay specific, we thought that we needed both standardization and a diversity of protocols. The standardization is important for at least informing the community of what works and what doesn't work, um, but having this diversity of protocols will provide um, sort of different, it will provide information for different individuals that want to perform these different assays. Um, and we also felt that different assays, for example, single cell RNA-seq versus single nucleus RNA-seq, could actually provide different information about the state of the cells. Um, and, and then I had asked, asked a question because of this sort of realizing that the community wanted standardization and diversity of protocols. Um, if anybody actually has been depositing their protocols into protocols IO, um, and there were, there were, I think, only five groups out of a, a room of, of, I believe, 30 to 40 individuals. So, so you know, a few groups are depositing protocols into protocols IO, but maybe less than, than I would have anticipated. Um, the the Donna Farber group really sort of made, made this good point, which is, you know, maybe one way to incentivize people to use protocols IO is um, this idea that it could serve as a living no lab notebook for um, a large group of individuals that are working on a project together. Um, and, but what's important here is that, you know, we should also do some internal validation of the protocols before posting it onto this uh, forum. Um, and we ended up with a few charges for the STWG, um, rather than, than thinking of um, having the standards technology and working group to sort of develop one protocol for every tissue, um, we thought that what the STWG should do is provide some guidelines, right? So if there are certain workflows that just won't work for a particular tissue, it's good to inform people before um, they start trying that. Um, and then also provide some suggestions, especially for hard to work with tissues. Um, and and the Donna Faber team also made this point um, that, that we should, uh, actually, sorry, Hoger made this point that we should take the data um, from various publications about specific protocols, especially these comparison publications that he's been leading, and, and put that back into protocols IO as sort of um, more of a, a quantitative way of, of measuring how, how a particular protocol is performing compared to another. Um, and that would, that would be part of the guidelines. Um, and then we sort of has, had a discussion about the current technological uh, considerations. Um, and one thing that we sort of realized is that in some cases, we have to do single nucleus RNA-seq just because single cell RNA sequencing won't work. Um, for example, sequencing adipocytes. And, and, but there's really a, a lack of extensive comparisons between these two modalities on tissues where maybe both assays will work okay. Um, and so there was a discussion about just how well correlated these assays are, and maybe these, dis these sort of comparisons has already been done, but uh, certainly it's not um, known to, to the community exactly how well these assays are correlated and what's missing in one. Um, there's a point brought up about problems with, with heterogeneity, uh, and so as we're thinking about these different technical considerations and comparisons between assays, one thought was, well, maybe we should just take a piece of tissue, slice it in half, and do comparisons between two assays. Well, that turns out not to actually be trivial because you could take a piece of um, tissue, slices in half, especially tumors, and you would just capture one cell type in one half and, and not in the other. Um, and then we also had a discussion on other alternative workflows. Um, Goji made a great point here that for a community like this, standardization is really great, and it's, it's, it's wonderful that we're all using, or ma many of us are using, um, just a few protocols, because that, that means that we could really compare data across uh, tissues. Um, but we should be cognizant of the other workflows, mostly because some of them have the potential to really scale, um, and this includes the microwell workflows as well as these split pool combinatorial indexing approaches. Uh, that the University of Washington groups have been developing. Um, and then finally, we, we sort of talked about the sequencing considerations of MGI versus Illumina, um, and both the UK and Australia groups presented some um, anecdotes about that, that the results are actually quite similar between the modalities, and in fact, in uh, the case of calling uh, genetic variants from single cell RNA sequencing data, the longer reads afforded by the MGI appears to actually give you more power to call SNPs.
And so we then finished with um, uh, a, a discussion on, on optimal experimental design. Um, the, the question that so I posed to the community is I think we need to figure out a way to define what parameters to actually optimize over. Um, so for example, is do we really want to optimize how deeply we sequence per cell? Um, there's this general consensus that we should have some general purpose metrics without any of the downstream analysis, like uh, without any of the clustering or, or um, differential expression analysis, for example. Um, but then I have suggested that we should also look at some of the information theoretical approaches, uh, mostly because that, um, you know, in that case, we do actually care about what the downstream analysis is. Um, and there's some really nice papers uh, that's starting to emerge in, 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 that, in that field. Um, and then we should also consider the economics. Maybe what we want to optimize is not how many reads seek to sequence per cell, but how many reads seek to sequence per cell given how much um, resources we have. Um, and so one of the most promising ways to sort of, um, you know, really optimize experimental design is to, to do cell hashing or to multiplex many samples together for single cell profiling. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do this. There's you know, genetics with antibodies labeled with oligonucleotides or cholesterol labeled with oligonucleotides or viruses if you can infect the cells. Um, and in general, these methods allow us to increase the throughput um, per sample as well as per cell if we overload uh, and identify and remove doublets. It will provide us with better data and it works for multiple modalities including single cell, single nucleus, RNA-seq, as well as single cell tax-seq and site-seq. Um, considerations here for whether or not we're processing fresh versus frozen samples, uh, how easy it is to perform the assays, and how many samples we can actually multiplex together. And that's, you know, in many cases, really a function of how long you want your cells to be sitting around. Um, and we think that these multiplexing approaches are really useful for assessing differences in technologies or sites, um, different ways of crowd uh, preserving tissue, uh, and finally, to, to start to look at human variation. So that's all I have. We're supposed to do questions, Thank you. Right? That, was, that was a fantastic overview. So if there are any questions for Jimmy or, or actually any of the experimental design community. You know, I feel a little bit like a broken record, but I think experimental design, uh, especially regarding your, your last slide of how many reads per cell, how many samples, and all that, needs to be very closely tied to what questions do you want to ask, and, and, and that needs to be priorities, because there's always uh, trade-offs. Um, and just a comment regarding the generalization versus standardization from, I think, the first slide. I think we are going to have to have different uh, assays for, for different tissues. And I think that there's going to be trade-offs and there should be, you know, best practices rather than mm -hmm. general diversity. But the first point is, is, I think, really, I think anything that has to do with experimental design and what to choose needs to be driven by define the questions and goals, and that needs to be much better defined, uh, certainly in the earlier stages um, where we're at right now. Yeah, that's a fair point, I think, it, and, and I do think that in the discussion, we, we didn't really get into that, whether or not we want to identify new cell types, for example, rare cell types, or is it to look for differential expression between cell types? I think those are important um, considerations that, that do affect experimental design. And I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think a lot of the um, sort of the information theoretical papers are, you know, most of them are based on what question are you asking, right, to optimize over that. So, yeah, great point. And other members of my uh, chair team, please feel free to contribute. Yeah, there's one, yeah. Uh, hi, I think it's a really good idea uh, to multiply sample to reduce batch effect and reduce cost. Um, do you have recommendations which um, methods should be used, like uh, using genetics or cell hashing or other? Yeah, um, well, you're putting me on spot li a little bit. Um, so, so I think, you know, so there are certain advantages to, to, to the genetic multiplexing if you have different individuals. 
The reason for that is it's still the easiest workflow because you literally just throw cells or nuclei together and it works for single cell, single nucleus, RNA-seq, attack-seq, seq for basically any sequencing-based readout. However, if, you have, if, you know, if you're working in a situation where you have fresh samples, right, and, and you only have maybe one or two, there's still ways to increase throughput by using antibody-based labels or um, cholesterol-based labels to increase the throughput just for that one sample because that one sample is going to be genetically identical. So I think if, you, if we figure out ways to really crowd preserve lots of samples across many individuals of different genetic backgrounds, then I think multi genetic multiplexing is great. Um, but if, you know, if you have one sample, then certainly these other approaches are going to work yeah, uh, better. Yeah. I'll, add a, I'll add a comment on that that when you think about mapping a big organ, you might want to take that organ and break it into smaller pieces, and then each of these yep. pieces you would want to have barcoded and run them together. So even though you're not in, you're in streaming mode and you're just getting this organ right now, you would still want a design that lets you address that. Otherwise, each of these needs to be analyzed separately, and that's going to be both costly and introduce a major batch effect exactly at the one moment in time where you don't want it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And you can tell I only sequence immune cells. <laughs> Sorry, is there another? Is there a comment over there? Bruce has a. You need a mic for the streaming. Yeah, I, I just completely agree with what you said, Aviv. And the. Um, What's the right way to do that? How to, how to set up the, the steady design sampling protocol and then get the metadata associated with the samples so that it really propagates so that you can build back a picture. And, and you know, for example, let's say um, um, small lung versus um, normal lung versus hypertrophic lung, or the same for heart, any organ. And so, so hypo development. Um, how do we how do we really represent? And it could be like you know Dana showed in other examples where there's the exact same cells are there. They're all the cell cell um, relationships are all fine. The programming's right, but it, you only find out that, that that you've got a disease phenotype here. You know hypertrophic lung development um, be based on um, the the size of the organ and then the way that you you let's say put on barcodes into these regions and then get size coordinates of between those regions so that you could then build back from the, the data a picture that really the only thing that's defective here is the, um, the, the extent of these you know, sampled areas that do show the same you know, common um, underlying programming between the cell-cell relations. And then you see, ah, it's a different level that the, that the disease um, regulation caused the, you know, the end organ failure. And, and, it, and it's not detectable in the cell code so much as in the overall tissue code. Yeah, I think I think it's a, it's a good point um, that we want to be linking the the cellular level to the, the the macro level and basically combine these sort of hashing considerations with uh, metadata considerations. And um, unless there are any other questions. That really brings us very nicely to the data standardization session. So let's thank Jimmy again. Okay, and I see that Peter will be representing this. Great. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it will be hard to follow Jimmy, I think. It was very thorough coverage. So, but I'll try to cover the main points. So we had the, a discussion on, on three major topics, so data standardization, normalization, and integration of data sets. And I think the enthusiasm kind of went up you know, on all these three. So starting with, a, with the first one, um, data standardization. So the, there were, um, I think, a number of uh, suggestions about quality control metrics. Um, in general, I, I think several. So first of all, organization, what we've done, we actually uh, did an experiment. We split up the, uh, uh, the, the audience into a number of groups, and, and they all discussed within themselves the types of questions and suggestions that they wanted. And then we tried to compile it together. So we had independent replicates here coming up with separation, let's say, of sample and cell level QC. Um, in general, uh, you know, for, for, for a sample, you might want to um, uh, discuss sort of the coverage uh, concerns, let's say library complexity, things like this. Uh, but there are a lot of cell level characteristics that, that uh, would be useful in downstream analysis potentially, um, not just depth, but um, I don't know, let's say mitochondrial fraction, uh, things like this. And uh, in general, just, just 
listing those and paying more attention to them, uh, it was suggested to be useful. Um, I think uh, there was a suggestion to kind of report them, especially if DCP is actually, uh, DCP pipelines are estimating this, uh, so that some of the downstream analysis can take advantage of this. But I think a, a, a more um, advanced suggestion was to basically try to move away from the kind of manual thresholding that's uh, done currently. So if, if you're using standard pipelines, uh, let's say Cell Ranger and, and others, uh, the, there's an automated selection of thresholds, let's say, for cell size. But if you look at other characteristics of the cells, then uh, typically, you know, sometimes you might have a hard-coded uh, threshold somewhere, let's say, for mitochondrial fraction or something like this. And, uh, and essentially, the, a couple groups uh, expressed a desire to, to be able to learn this automatically, to look at the distributions of different characteristics, maybe uh, some in addition to those that we're used to, um, and, then, and then suggest you know, selection uh, thresholds or some, let's say, cell quality scores based on combination of these uh, automatic um, uh, predictors. Um, the, there were a couple of groups that suggested also improved spike-ins. And so, as, as uh, I'm sure all of you uh, know, that, that you know, initially in the, in the early protocols, there was a lot of attention paid to, let's say, ERCC spike-ins and, and, and other ones. And in fact, many normalization methods initially were designed um, uh, around this. And, and now, I think uh, the suggestions were a bit more advanced in a sense that maybe have like whole cell or artificial cell sort of spike-ins. And, and, uh, 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 there was also desire expressed that it would be nice to have them integrated uh, sort of as a standard, maybe with kits and so on, so everyone actually has those. Um, the data standardization discussion naturally led to uh, sort of enforcement and requirements and so on um, by DCP. I mean, I, understanding that the DCP may not be the, the right exact entity that would be um, uh, formulating these rules, but... Um, uh, as, as a contact point anyway. So the question is, you know, what, what, what would be, you know, minimum metadata, metadata requirements and suggestions? And, and the general formulation of this is to, to what extent, you know, as, a, as an HCA community, do we actually want to enforce metadata requirements? Um, because obviously, you know, we need some metadata, and, 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 uh, but, but uh, uh, the question is, where, where do we draw the balance between uh, requiring, you know, very extensive descriptions uh, versus having sort of minimal descriptions uh, that would be acceptable. Um, and the four, you know, the related to quality control metrics is similar, uh, similar idea, you know, minimal quality requirements. So you could imagine that uh, a sample, and uh, let's say that does not pass some quality thresholds and so on, could, could be just rejected, or it could be flagged uh, or scored in some way. And we've seen, you know, in the past consortia that, that went either way. Uh, and particularly since we're dealing with different platforms uh, in, the, in this project and we expect additional platforms and, and protocols to appear, you know, these types of formulations of, let's say, minimal requirements may, may get pretty complicated. Um, and it also kind of led to a discussion of, in general, what types of data sets should be submitted to DCP or would be acceptable to DCP. Um, is it just sort of production things that we actually want to be part of collection human cell atlas going forward? Are, are we okay with, let's say, submitting pilot runs on a new technique that we think would be interesting to, uh, to researchers, but you know, not really sort of production quality yet and so on? And depending on that answer, right, the, the requirements, I think, for uh, both, you know, mm, let's say quality thresholds uh, and, and other information may, may differ. Uh, the also naturally because there are multiple consortia going on and a lot of people actually in multiple consortia the, the question is uh, can we coordinate this well, with other uh, consortia both in terms of requirements and formats um, it, it does seem like sometimes you're you're in a deja vu because you're in a different consortium discussing the same exact question and uh, I think coordination on that level at least for ongoing projects would be very useful as well Okay, so normalization, um, we, the general, I think, question was, the initial one is, how widely and how universally should it be, should it be applied? And, and this is my global normalization scheme. So um, ideally, of course, we would feed the data sets you know, through, let's say, standardized pipelines and DCP that would all be normalized and we would never think about this. But uh, the, it, it seems like there's some dependence on the downstream analysis and the aims of the downstream analysis and uh, 
And depending on, on what you're trying to do, you may want to use one normalization or another normalization. But this essentially an open topic and, and it was a little bit unclear um, what we want to do there. But uh, it, it seemed like there were different opinions. So we didn't recommend, I don't think there was a recommendation to use the same normalization method everywhere. Um, so there's a couple of interesting points, I think. Uh, so Alicia brought up, you know, in general, because we have these different normalization methods that could be applied, and, and maybe, let's say, DCP would be applying, you know, giving you several options for normalization, what would be very important is to uh, discuss and formulate in, in simple terms the, the assumptions that are underlying these normalization methods. So let's say a, a person who is not intimately familiar with these algorithms would be able to understand the potential impact of these normalization techniques on the downstream analysis they're trying to do. Uh, so a simple example was... Uh, uh, you know, the standard normalization essentially assumes that all the cells are of the same size, right? And if you're trying to analyze an effect that, a biological effect that, that may be related to this, uh, you know, the standard normalization may not be appropriate. Um, so being able to formulate these assumptions and sort of uh, communicate them to, um, to the users uh, would be useful. Um, the other suggestion uh, from the same group was, was that it would be good to capture an overview of variation uh, before normalization, or in other ways, uh, another way of putting it, you know, capturing the overview of variation that you will remove with normalization uh, to, to assess both the magnitudes of the effects that are being removed uh, as well as their sources, right? So the source is a little bit more difficult to, uh, uh, to capture sometimes, but, you know, because we have metadata, both technical and, 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 and submitted metadata, sometimes you can see that, let's say, the, the major variation that was removed was platform-based or cell size-based and so on. So, so, but having this as a separate output, um, uh, sort of before normalization, may help researchers to assess the impact. Um, also, discussion related to this, you know, as to how much variation uh, is, is, is meaningful, right? So if we normalize everything to, to look, you know, very similar, are we getting rid of the signals? And, you know, how much variation should be expected uh, from, let's say, same cell type in different contexts or different cell types, like Tregs uh, might vary a lot, epithelial cells, not so much. Uh, benchmarks, I, I, I don't think there was a, a general desire, uh, a there was a general desire to basically have more uh, illustrations or evaluations of different normalization methods um, uh, in different scenarios. So if you're trying to do, let's say, um, integration, differential expression, or if, you integ if you're looking at uh, one platform or another, basically look at how different normalization methods work for, for these uh, different cases. And just to have this sort of as a set of examples would have been useful. Uh, there was a suggestion to basically have dreamlike competitions uh, around some of these problems. Um, right, regressing out features like cell cycle, background, and so on. Um, there was general agreement that you know, we shouldn't do this by default, but uh, the question is, you know, what controls and options should be provided to the Atlas users uh, to remove some of these things? All right, and integration. So we discussed, you know, variety of integration scenarios uh, within HCA. Let's say integrating across platforms and protocols, uh, across individuals, obviously tissues, or across molecular modalities. So with molecular modalities, you know, if you're integrating, let's say, with something very different, like with imaging. Um, the, the question was, um, how do we, in terms of design, you know, how do we decide whether to, let's say, integrate imaging and molecular data and then split up the cell types or cell, defin cell group definitions based on that? Uh, should we do this? Should we basically uh, use combinations of data, right, to refine, to arrive at sort of more refined definitions of cell subpopulations or not? And if we are using multiple modalities to define subpopulations, how do we determine what combination of modalities uh, should be best used? So across different, let's say, uh, uh, teams, uh, tissue-specific teams, you know, the different combinations of protocols are being used. Should there be a discussion as to what combination is most informative, perhaps, or, uh, or, or should be most common? Um, yeah, there was a, a question as, you know, whether integration should be automated to some extent, um, but realistically, it, it means, you know, what options should be, again, provided to the users? Should, should you be able to say, I would, I would like to integrate these data sets and then uh, have it, this done in real time? Uh, and the question of just Atlas-wide integra integration. Obviously, we didn't answer this one. 
uh, but to what extent, uh, what, what kind of sorry, problems uh, could be addressed with atlas-wise int integration. Um, there was an emphasis on integration with model organisms, in particular, you know, say mice or, or disease model organisms. Uh, if we can improve this, and, and you know, maybe even through specialized methods for this, uh, that can potentially be extremely useful and sort of a standard approach you know, for, let's say, testing something in mice and then translating uh, between humans and mice. Uh, it's not clear whether we need specialized methods for this, but um, uh, something that would be good to test. And finally, uh, with integration, there's this kind of question of experimental design. Um, how do we assess, you know, do we need different quality requirements um, uh, for uh, integration? How do we assess the, the actual quality of the, of the result? Uh, how many samples should you sort of plan for if you're doing this type of integrative analysis? And, um, and in, in context of multimodal assays, can we say that we're planning on, let's say, integrating future protocols uh, with the you know, current data that's being generated? Uh, is that a realistic scenario? And, and should we plan ahead for this? So these were the main topics, and, and uh, I encourage my co-chairs to chime in if I forgot something, as well as the, um, uh, the main audience as well. Thank you, Peter. Any questions? Otherwise, I'll start. Actually, so I think that was very far-reaching and, and a global discussion, really helpful. I think um, if you go back to the normalization slide, I don't know if you can, that I think that's a, a really crucial point, and Donna has already discussed it. And I wonder whether um, the, the benchmarks you know, that are out now on BioArchive and from Joshua and from um, Holger and the, the team, whether they could help with assessing so we, we have, a with Fabian Tyson's group, we had a paper recently in Nature Methods with test metrics. So, okay, nearest neighbor batch effect test. And, you know, there are other test metrics like silhouette coefficient and so on and so forth for assessing. Yep. And I wonder whether those kinds of tests could be applied to the, the benchmarks, for instance, with yep. all the normalization methods that are out there now. That, that could be a good starting point, just as, a, as an idea to throw out there. I don't know what you guys, yeah. you know, what you guys um, think. I mean, I think... Well, personally, I think it would be great. I think in terms of the, the discussion that we had, there was a, the, the, the sort of the, the interesting point was that people wanted to see how the normalization methods perform in different scenarios. Yeah, right? I think so, that's a major challenge because the ideal scenario is, you know, PBMCs or cell lines right. or something, you know, it that's kind of an different. idealized, but the, the real life challenges of integrating uh, things that are completely confounded, uh, you know, in terms of, tissue, individual, and so on, that's much more challenging. And I don't, but it's, you know, very hard then also to, to benchmark, right? Well, the sense that I got that, that what people were suggesting, that it would be useful to, to have sort of, um, you know, vignettes, essentially, uh, that, that would mm. give people a sense yeah. for how well they, these different normalization methods perform mm. under a variety of common scenarios. Now, you know, I, I don't think the aim is to sort of split hairs in terms of the, you know, exact champion or not. But but to sort of see what approaches are acceptable and give reasonable no, no, results. No, yeah, yeah. I think that's totally. Is the benchmark in this setting basically a ground truth that you aspire to? Uh, uh, well, I do. Or how yes, do you but know that the know. normalization and this is this works. is the issue? Yeah. Yeah. We, I I don't think we have sort of ground truth data sets realistically, right? But that also works into this, you know, kind of approximate comparison. So I think, in general, we can usually set up benchmark that tells you if, if you do, if you get it completely wrong or like really badly. Uh, but so you know, sorting out the difference between reasonably well performing methods that requires much more precise benchmark, and and maybe we don't have some in this case. Uh, maybe I haven't thought about it long enough. But yeah, my impression was that you know, if if we set up these kind of realistic uh, scenarios and compare methods on them, even with sort of uh, intuitive maybe. Not, not, not completely precise benchmarks, um, that, that would be very helpful already because people basically would like to pick a normalization method that, that's reasonable. I mean, on the... Jay? Jay? Yep. Or, uh, or, I, or just Bruce, a, yeah. Just a really sh um, short point. I, I don't, back in the old, old, old days, um, we would um, take a precise transcript and, and use T7, make an exact number of molecule count, and then calibrate what 
and then and then put that into um, you know or an array or, or whatever RNA seq and then mm -hmm. and with the right term you know um, poly A it if necessary and then and really get molecule to molecule calibrations going I, I don't know I don't see a way to do that at scale here in this context with you and know, I think the only way is spike ins <laughs> molecular yeah. spike ins that's what but, we've attempted but to how do how you do the but spike ins is to really get to yeah. true molecule counts it, well, right. I mean, not that in theory, in that's, methods, that's, um, that's what the spike in tells you, right? Because it's number of counts. But yeah, it's a good point. Okay, well, the same. Can, we, can we go to J maybe and then Donna? Would that be a... Would, oh, oh, sorry. No, no, Donna, go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to say this. I mean, that's not what I wanted to say. I just spike ins don't take into account cell lysis, which is one of the biggest factors of no, yeah. differences, so I'm actually a big, yeah. I don't cell, think spike-ins spike help in. because the biggest factor of variation isn't captured by them, but that's not the point I wanted to really make. But, but you have to do yeah, I mean, that, you get some idea of capture, but, but yeah, so the, 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 way you, the way you could get at it would be to spike in to a cell line, for instance, and then spike in the cell line into the biological sample, so you could kind of go around like that. I mean, the, the, there, are, there are problems with biological spike-ins. But anyway, Jay, Jay, yeah. Jay do you want to go on? Yeah, I'll yeah. change the topic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so from a user perspective of the, the, and the experimental inputs, uh, I think metadata is extremely important. Of course, every, every individual has different way of recording metadata. And I guess there are some general descriptions that we can input. But how to parse that, that will make sure that every metadata that we generate are synchronized across all the users so that it will help your analysis of data standardization and so on. So I guess it's more to the question to DCP or is it to the working group as to whether there's a standard method of metadata uh, recording okay. and, and, and okay. inputs. Yeah, so I, I think we, we didn't get to that level of sort of metadata format and reporting. Uh, I, I'm you know, I'm sure this is kind of in DCP territory exactly, you know, how they want this formula and so on. Uh, I think the discussion we had mostly focused on the, on the extent of metadata that we would like to require, sort of the minimal requirements, and just the general, let's say, style that, that HCA should adopt. Should we be sort of metadata heavy and really, you know, encourage or press on the, on the submitting teams to, to, to express, you know, very detailed metadata, or should we be more permissive in this regard and then hope that the data analysis itself would, would be revealing? Yeah, I mean, there's clearly a very close relationship between the metadata and then the computational interpretation, and that's fantastic. Good. Thank you very much, Peter. That's really great. Okay, so for the next session, we've got Ajay, who's going to report back on the Common Coordinate Framework. Okay, thanks. Um, so this is a report back from the Common Coordinate Framework, which is the, is the first such breakout session organized at the HCA, I believe. Um, maybe not. Um, so it's going to be a little um, less detailed compared to the other two working groups because we don't really have any implemented solutions yet. So. We started off the discussion. It was a, it was a fairly lively discussion. Um, there was lots of participation, and uh, people sh people talked a lot. And uh, um, they should talk again now, if specifically if there are questions that I'm sure I can't handle. Um, so we started off by saying, if we do build common coordinate frameworks, what are the biological questions that could uh, be answered? And there were a number of different things. Um, some of them related to comparisons between healthy and disease with respect to anatomical location. Um, that these sorts of maps would be useful in regenerative medicine because you may want to repair tissue at specific places within the organ and maybe location dependent. Um, then you could understand things like um, various axes in organ development, molecular gradients, the differences between cores and periphery in, a, in an organ, understanding how uh, differences in mechanical stress uh, may be mapped to various regions and how they might be molecularly different. 
Um, another use case was for building generative models, which are building processes that give rise to organ structure from the molecular information that we gather. So these were some of the major uh, themes in the biological use case arena. You then handle questions of, well, what does a common coordinate framework actually mean? Can you have um, a single one for the body, single one for an organ, there are different ones for um, between gender, between development stages. Um, so this, these discussions um, actually led to a question of, well, what sort of differences and variants do we want to map? And that's basically how you end up deciding um, the question of one or more CCF. And another interesting thing that came up is how do people, if they generate their own maps, um, link that to a reference map? How, how does that process work? Um, <clears throat> and uh, we discussed questions of whether this coordinate, common coordinate framework should be considered in a, in a hierarchical manner an example of Russian dolls um, was, was brought up. Um, another element in, in building common coordinate frameworks was whether or not this should be probabilistic as opposed to coordinates X, Y, and Z. Um, and finally, we sort of punted on the question of what to do with things like um, unstructured organs and circulating cells. Um, and what, what would a common coordinate framework there mean? And essentially, it brought down to a question of looking for common patterns within these um, sort of unstructured spaces to see if it made sense and what sort of a sense what a uh, um, common coordinate framework would take. Um, a different perspective on building common coordinate framework is by looking at it in terms of ontologies. And um, it was brought up that um, labeling on anatomy, various nomenclature of um, subparts of organs might be the, one of the first useful steps that we can build in terms of creating um, a common coordinate framework and allowing people to, to project their data onto um, the same parts of, of the organ. And it was also mentioned that uh, ontologies provide a good backup for, for a coordinate system. Um, and the, um, the DCP, uh, especially with respect to their location within EBI, has very specific expertise in, in enabling the community with, with various ontologies. So that's an, something that we can advantageously use. Um, a challenge with different groups working on ontologies, which came up in the previous discussions, uh, is this question of harmonizing between ontologies, um, that you use the same term to mean the same thing in different settings. And that's usually a, a big challenge that, that we would need to overcome if ontologies have to be used as common coordinate frameworks. Um, then the whole question of various human level challenges for, for doing the mapping exercise, um, building, um, bringing the right group of people into um, the conversation. This is going to remain a, 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 a big challenge. Um, getting the medical imaging community involved deeply in, in conversations with, with um, the HCA group, which looks at mostly molecular level information would be a, a particularly useful thing to do. Um, another human level challenge with, with a project like HCA with its diversity um, is how to agree on sampling um, an organ between different groups who work on the same organ. Um, can we do this consistently? And we ended up thinking through um, what possible next steps could be there for a for, uh, common coordinate framework. So does it make sense for the HCA to actually make an official working group 
um, that was left undecided. Um, it was decided that we will at least establish a Slack channel within HCA for a common coordinate frameworks. Um, various ideas for white papers and wikis and live streaming of various workshops was, um, was brought up. And finally, it might be useful to ha organize a series of webinars of people and groups that are actually working on, uh, on building such common coordinate frameworks and we could go through and make presentations on a regular basis and update everyone. Okay, so that brings me to the end of it. Thank you, Andre. Questions? on common coordinate framework. Yeah, Rasa. Hi, uh, there's a question from a uh, live stream from Mirazul. Um, he's asking about how HC defines cell types and cell states in terms of transcrip transcriptomic profile and how reliable are those transcriptomic definitions from functional point of view? So I mean, that's not really comment. CCF. Should we, should we address the CCF questions first and then maybe come back to that one for the general discussion in the next session? Now, thanks, Rasa, though, for transmitting. Shyam, would you like to talk? I don't know if uh, this has come up already, but it would be very useful to have an intracellular common coordinate framework, which may need to be different for different cell types. But uh, with spatial technologies, you can look at what's happening inside the geography of a cell, and some kind of sand standardized coordinate framework will help us compare across cells. Mm, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, and, and, go ahead. And, and I'll point out that uh, in the context of many tissues, because of cellular polarization, that was actually in the session, in terms of cellular polarization, you will need the intracellular information. It would be very useful also for local neighborhoods for cell-cell interactions, say in the immunological synapse. It's a good yeah. example of a polarized this, phenotype. This, I think as a, as a general concept, this was brought up in terms of the different scales at which such coordinate frameworks need to exist and work. Thanks. Any other questions? Bruce, you want to? Yeah. It's uh, somewhat obvious, but um, just I, I'm a little bit um, oh, worried that, that the CCF um, is a little bit too uh, insular and that really it, it should be considered um, maybe very tightly linked to just a general purpose sample ontology. So the more we understand the, you know, the, what, where the sample came from and the, all the aspects of the individual that it came from and, and, and then how different samples relate to each other, the CCF is inherent in that. So, so kind of not, um, just don't divorce yourselves. Mm. from, from this, yeah. all th aspects th of sampling. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good point, and I think within HubMap there's, there's awareness. Uh, Laura, please. Yeah. So um, to speak to that, obviously in, yeah. in the HCA metadata standards, we are trying to make sure that we have very good sample relationship mapping, the, that the organ system labeling and where available cell type labeling is already ontologized and as specific as the submitter can give us. So we're capturing um, as much information as we possibly can from the submitters about their, about their samples. And then this is sort of yet another dimension that enables us to take, you know, from a sort of, sort of flat distribution of information to then spatially resolved. And, 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 and I think, yeah, making sure we're doing both is super important. Yeah. yeah, so That's some of the discussions point. that happened were um, building um, models of organs and having the surgeons and pathologists locate where their samples came from within such a model Andrew? at the, at the bench top. I don't know, maybe this is just a random comment, but it just seems to me that this is potentially extremely powerful at the systems level. As you think about like the whole organs and whole um, organisms, um, uh, understanding if we understand properly where things are could have very important f understanding for, I guess for for disease, right? I mean, there may be particular stresses on certain parts of the organ, and knowing exactly where things came from could ultimately be very important, and also an understanding uh, developmental processes and how you get signaling between.
uh, places. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe this is no, a random thought. But I mean, one, one other thing I guess I throw in there is uh, maybe uh, as we're thinking of going to Mars and staying on the moon, that probably understanding um, spatial context, and I don't know whether anyone's thinking about, say, doing um, a mouse atlas from some a mouse that's been in space. I mean, there's the man in space uh, study, but of course you can't take all the um, you can't take all the biological samples from from a person, not without killing them, of course. Um, but with a mouse, you could do that, and maybe we should be thinking about studies like that uh, to really understand um, the physiological aspects of of space travel. And having a CCF would be very important there. Yeah. Very random. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is uh, super interesting. One, one question slash comment that I have is, is, is the purpose of the common coordinate framework only to describe relationships between tissues and cells in a spatial context, or is, there also, is it also meant to capture other types of relationships um, that, that we might encounter? Um, I mean, we have similar cell types in different parts that are spatially not close to each other, for example. And you know, should we think about this as a way to navigate this along different kinds of dimensions? There's this anatomical spatial organization, but maybe other types of organizations that should be captured as well. Yeah, so I mean, there, there, there was to some extent, not, this, not the specific one that you brought up, but there were other discussions about how do you think about um, um, constructing multiple types of common coordinate frameworks and how they can exist within the same structure and how you move from one to the other. How do you go from scaling just by size or scaling uh, in places where you don't have information from say CT scan or MRI scan to, to know where you are actually located, locating the sample uh, from. So those sorts of discussions did happen, but not the specific one that you brought up. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Ajay. And um, that's a great discussion. Thanks. We'll move to a more general discussion now.